Good morning. Idolatry seems like the most ridiculous of sins. Why would anyone worship an idol? As Paul says in Romans 1, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Why would Aaron, who was God's mouthpiece to Pharaoh, who had seen the ten plagues, the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea, the pillar of fire, the manna from heaven, the water from the rock, who had been up on Mount Sinai with, with Moses, make a golden calf idol. And then, reminding me of why criminal defense attorneys always tell their clients, don't say anything. Aaron says, so I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. What? Why would Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived other than Jesus, start worshiping idols? Why would the Israelites who had seen the mighty works of God with their own eyes start sacrificing their infants in the superheated arms of these idols they'd made? Why would Adam and Eve betray the God who walked with them in the garden for a talking snake? Many people today say they base their decisions on reason and science. And while there is value in true reason and true science, most people don't really base their decisions on them. Stalin, who was one of the most well-read men who ever lived, and Hitler and Mao, all cited reason and science as grounds for their monstrous decisions. Reason and science. And then there is principle. As a lawyer, I often hear people say, it's not about the money, it's the principle of the thing. Truthfully, it's usually not completely about the money, it's also about pride and power. Too often our guiding principles. When I was about 16, a friend of mine set me up with a date with a girl from a private school. I picked her up at her big house, and I think we drove around in my 1950 Mercury for a while, and maybe stopped for some ice cream, and then I took her home. I called her a day or two later, and she said she wasn't allowed to see me because her dad didn't like the fact that I'd showed up for the date wearing a black leather jacket and a t-shirt. Her father's instincts were right. But if there was anything I hated, it was someone trying to thwart my will. And I proceeded to secretly date that girl for two years. My dear brother-in-law during those years justifiably yelled at me one time, David, you are so damn willful. I started chasing idols when I was about 13, and e even after I repented and started seriously trying to follow Jesus in my 20s, I still struggled with the desire to pursue idols of money, sex, and power throughout my life, and frankly, the idols have won more than a few of my days. And I've had to repent again and again. I've learned this much. The lure of idols is the desire to have a God that you make and you control, so that in effect, you become a God unto yourself. Of course, the idol ends up controlling you. You think the idol will be your slave, but you end up being the idol's slave. So today, I preach 
to myself and to you, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's listen carefully to what Isaiah said, because this is generally considered the most extensive condemnation of idols in all the Scripture. Isaiah tells us that idol makers are useless. Idols are unprofitable. Idols can't deliver our souls from death, but they can deliver our souls to death. Idols are shameful. Idols are often made in human form according to the beauty of a man. Idols are made by man. We make a God a ridiculous notion, but we keep doing it. Idols are abominable, counterfeit gods. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. The rest of it, the wood he uses to make into a God. Idols are worshipped. And ultimately, they're obeyed. Idols blind us to reality. He has shut their eyes and their hearts. They can't understand. Idols deceive us. We don't realize the truth. The most powerful words in, in this passage are, is there not a lie in my right hand? The idol is the lie in our right hand. Idols led the Israelites into exile, out of the promised land. To say that it has proved very difficult for the Israelites to regain the promised land is an understatement. Idolatry has devastating effects in this world, and if not covered by the blood of Christ in the next world. Idolatry led King Manasseh to Saul, Isaiah, in two. Isaiah, the idolatry led Emperor Nero to murder the Apostle Paul. Tim Keller's books, book, Counterfeit Gods, The Empty Promises of Money, Sex, Power, and the Only Hope That Matters, can be seen as a commentary on Calvin's statement that the human mind is an idol factory. And Keller points out that even in the church, many of us continue to be enslaved by idols that are good things, making idols of good things. You know, Solomon said, money answers everything, a good thing. You can do a lot of good with money. But he also says, whoever has money never has enough. And Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. Money can become a bad thing. Sex. God says, be fruitful and multiply. He says that marriage is a photo of Christ's love for the church. And that married people shouldn't Den deny each other sexual intimacy. It's a good thing. But God says that we shouldn't be engaging in adultery, in homosexuality, in prostitution, in cross-dressing. A bad thing. Sex can become a bad thing. Power. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God has given us incomparably great power for those of us who believe. God can, God's power within us can be used to accomplish the purposes of the kingdom, the scriptures tell us. So power is a very good thing. But God warns us not to take revenge or return evil for evil. Don't be like the p pagans and seek to lord your power over other people. God causes Herod's insides to rot out and Nebuchadnezzar to be turned into an animal for seven years because they were glorifying their own power. Power can become a bad thing. A hammer can build a house, 
a good thing, but it can also be used to kill someone, a bad thing. Counterfeit money. What did I do? I actually had some counterfeit money with me, it was just Monopoly money. But none of us would trade even $5 of real money for $10,000 of Monopoly money because you can't buy anything with Monopoly money. It's worthless, as all counterfeits are. Yet we trade the presence of God, Christ within us, for the fleeting, vacuous presence of idols. We trade the truth of God for a pack of lies. We trade the creator of the universe for the creator of nothing. We trade God's infinite wisdom for the foolishness of idols. We trade the forgiving, sacrificial, agape love of God for the condemning, all-take, and no-give, fake love of idols. We trade the promise of joining thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly with the curse of joining thousands upon thousands of demons in misery, cursing, and torment. We trade eternity with God in the golden paradise of light for eternity in the pit of darkness in hell. Usually people have more than one idol. Idolatry has a tendency for self-multiplication. But what is the idol of idols? Public enemy number one. It's the guy in the mirror. The old self. Our pre-Christian self. For Christians, the old self should be an unwanted visitor. But for unbelievers, the old self is sadly all they ever are. For those of us who've been made new in Christ, the old self needs to be taken into the backyard, given a cigarette and a blindfold, and executed. But we are often reluctant to do that. The old self is a venerable idol. He slips into our minds with false, fa false nostalgic memories of our sinful past. He suggests that being wicked and lost was actually a good old time. Harmless fun. He blocks out memories of all the lies you told and all the people you betrayed and all the harm you caused and how you wasted many years of your life. We may try to hide the old self in a closet, dress him up to make him look respectable, but the truth is that there are things about him that we are tempted to still like and to make us smile. To kill him would be too extreme. But it is said, and I think with great truth, that until we hate our sin, hate, our old self. We can't fully love Jesus. That is because unless we understand the immensity of our debt to God, we can't comprehend the immensity of Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross. Quoting Jesus, he who has been forgiven much loves much. He who has been forgiven little loves little. The old self has many disguises. Existentialism is a 50 cent fancy word for choosing your own moral code. And you make up your own truth and your own reality. And then you live it to live a genuine life. When you witness to someone and they come back to you with, that's true for you, or that works for you, that's existentialism. The problem with existentialism was identified by one of its great, uh, 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 great proponents, Sartre, who said, hell is other people. And the problem is that if everybody is deciding on their own truth, there's going to be a whole lot of conflict and disappointment. And how does that conflict get resolved? If you don't have the Ten Commandments and you don't have the Sermon on the Mount or any standard, 
The only way it gets resolved is by tooth and claw, by the old principle that he who has the gold makes the rules, or violence is good as long as you're the winner. You know, the word existentialism kind of fell out of favor when somebody wrote that book, The Me Generation. And then we had the entire yuppie era in the 80s. And that proved again that unbridled selfishness tears down our community. I couldn't help but think about my generation, the me generation, when during COVID we shut down all the schools and the churches so that the me generation could have more security, real or imagined, without regard to the enormous harm being inflicted on children and youth to say nothing of the harm it caused to the church. But no matter how many times this, the old self-idol is exposed and discredited, he comes back wearing a different cloak. Carl Truman, a professor at Glo Grove City, wrote a book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Cultural amnesia, expressive individualism, and the road to sexual revolution that well describes how we got to where we are here at the end of 2023. The modern self that Truman describes is really just the old self idol. The modern self says our feelings, our thoughts, our reimagining of ourselves in the world are the most important thing. Physical or historical reality, much less the transcendent truth of God, is irrelevant. And our means of oppression of the modern self, which is a victim fighting for liberation. So if we are a man, if we feel we are a woman, it's true. If we are white, if we feel we are Native American, it's true. If we imagine ourselves to be a good student, it's true. If we feel ourselves to have been sexually or emotionally abused, it's true. If we feel ourselves to be the victim of economic, social, or sexual oppression, it's true. Truman says we want people to make much of us. And if anyone says anything that hurts our feelings, calls into question our truth, or the validity of our chosen victim identity, they are oppressors, aggressors, and all legal means, be it firing, censorship, prison, fines, and even extra-legal measures, including intimidation and violence, are justified to up hold the validity of our feelings. In the modern self-world, math, history, art, science, economics, law, literature, language, music, religion, all are means of oppression and must give way to our felt needs. If a student doesn't do well on a test, the test must be changed, the teacher must be changed, perhaps even the parents must be changed. But the idol of the old self doesn't stop there. His feelings rule over all of life. There's money. The modern self often sees money as the root of all evil, but only if it is in the hands of other people. The modern self loves money and things because he thinks lots of money and things will make him real, genuine, awesome, cool, amazing, worthy, love and that he will be in control of his life. The biblical teaching that the money is God's money, and with money comes responsibility of being God's trustee, of generosity and sacrificial love, is cast aside. Instead, the modern self uses money to cover up his sins. The doctor leaves his wife and kids for his nurse, but leaves them a generous divorce settlement. The modern self uses money to avoid having risky, uncomfortable, unexpected, and difficult relationships and contacts with people. In other words, he avoids the divine appointments where God could use him and grow him. He doesn't just Photoshop out all the unwanted relationship and contacts off of his social media accounts. He Photoshops them out of his life. The only people he interacts with are those who agree with him and warm up his cold ego. In sum, the modern self-idol uses his money to control other people 
so their behavior suits his felt, felt needs. Covetedness is always cloaked. Very few people say they want money because, hey, I'm greedy, or, oh, I can't get enough stuff. It is always about having a decent standard of living for themselves or providing for their families or planning for the future or getting their fair share or even so they can give more money to the church. Yet no matter what we make for the modern self, it is never enough. There is always one more thing that was once a luxury and now is a necessity. As for church giving, well, that 2.5% figure of net income that Howard always mentions is not exactly evidence of generosity. How about this fact? There's 247 million Americans who identify themselves as Christian, of which 1.5 million tithe. Have you ever thought about the real-world consequences for you of tithing? Is it the difference between a vacation in New Mexico and one in Hawaii? Is it the difference between a car payment on a Tahoe and a car payment on a Suburban? Is it the difference between a mortgage payment on a three-bedroom house and a two-bedroom house? Is it the difference between having dinner at home once a week instead of eating out? Or maybe it's as simple as just giving up bad habits such as idols. And if you're living on a pension or Social Security, could you tithe your time? Your very self, as the word says. Are we unwilling to make even small sacrifices for the kingdom? So what do we do about idolatry? Be a Thessalonian. Those people we just read about, they experienced all the genuine hope and joy in the world because they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Are you an unbeliever? Are you a believer but you, your walk with Christ has slowed to a crawl? Is your faith wavering? Are you haunted with discouragement and despair? Could the real issue be idolatry? How are your idols working for you? Has your old self and its idols living by what feels good, pleasing other people, chasing status, sex, money, power, continued to rule your life? Have your idols led you to joy and love and satisfaction and hope? My favorite sports writer is a guy named Jason Whitlock. He talks about sports from a Christian perspective. And this week he wrote, just a coincidence that he wrote this this week, my genuine obsession is with sharing a worldview that leads to improved decision making and rids people of their idolatry. We live in an era ruled by idolatry, the religious worship of idols, whether it be food, sex, money, popularity, material goods, youth, race, or the alleged heroes and influencers popular culture celebrates. Idols control our behavior and interfere with our obedience to the truths spelled out in the Bible. I suffer from idolatry, a battle I fight with prayer, meditation, song, and study of the word. Are you ready to become fully dependent on the creator of the universe? The God who suffered and died for your sins of idolatry who gives you an eternal life filled with joy in his presence starting today? Are you ready to experience the eternal pleasures God has for you right at his right hand? Are you ready to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit, the killer of idols, who, if you let him, will guide and empower you to truly live in the middle of God's will so you live a noble life in harmony with your Creator and Redeemer? Are you ready to have every one of your prayers answered in the most loving way possible by the God who knows the future and therefore can get every de detail perfectly handled? Then toss the idols of the old self in the dumpster and let the new self, Christ in us, thrive just as the Thessalonians did.
Jesus delivers us from slavery to idols. You want a meaningful, world-changing life? Stop living to please or glorify yourself. Stop living to glorify or please other people, either to warm your ego or for financial gain. Instead, live to glorify and please God. He is worthy of all glory because he created us. He is worthy of all glory because he redeemed our lives from the pit of hell with his own blood on the cross. We, in turn, should treat our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as the lost and wounded, gently, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. We should be affectionately desirous of others, not for what we can gain from them, but in order to share with other people not only the gospel of God, but our very selves. Because other people are not hell. They are very dear to us. Let us pray. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to make us stand in his presence, holy, blameless, and with great joy, to the only God our Savior and Jesus Christ our Son, his Son, be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power for all time and now and forever. Amen.